Big money sentiment shows that there is still a lot of pessimism in the markets. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to The Daily Show, where we discuss stocks, commodities, and cryptos. Today, we'll be talking about the data coming through the Barron's Big Money Survey, along with our post thoughts on the FOMC meeting, the non-farm payrolls, jobs numbers coming up, and of course, Apple earnings. But there's even more going on in these markets at this stage because central bank liquidity is something focused in on our minds and we'll be updating our charts on that along with US bank liquidity and of course the small regional banks. Some of them were down as much as 50% in after hours trade. Do we need to be concerned? Let's get into the charts right now. Well, welcome back, everyone, to The Daily Show, where we talk about markets around the world. And we'll start here with, of course, the big news. Then we'll get into the macro, the lead indicators, and, of course, the hottest charts and the key levels. We'll be covering stocks, commodities, and cryptos. If it's your first time here, subscribe and smash that like button. We've got a lot of value in today's video, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. PacWest, what happened? 50% down after hours. They're doing some type of raise or something like that, trying to find money. And it wasn't just that bank that was down. This is just another one of the dominoes. We've got Xeons and Western Alliance also hit negative 20% overall. So regional banking, you know, according to the Fed, it's all good. Don't worry, it's stable. But the reality is they are falling and falling like flies. And we've got this chart that we'll update soon and we'll show you it, how much assets now compared to the global financial crisis have actually come under fire since this whole thing started with Silicon Valley Bank. So Apple earnings are coming out. We know it's going to be a relatively volatile event, expected move around 4 to 5% based on the options market. And to counteract potentially weak sales, what are they going to do? They're going to use, of course, some cash position to effectively pay out a dividend, maybe even do a nice cash buyback. Well, what would you think? <laughs> Another company trying to do something like that to keep the levels up high. It's nothing new and Apple's earnings will, of course, potentially be a massive catalyst for the market. So we'll look at the chart later on. So this Fed decision, what happened in this FOMC? Well, it was pretty much just a hawkish pause. Effectively, the Fed said the same things that we thought they were going to. They just kept going on about inflation being elevated, banking systems supposedly being resilient. They're not going to say anything else other than that. They obviously came out with a policy phrase change where they removed the additional policy increases might be appropriate. What does that mean? Well, they're probably going to pause. And even with the pause being noted in, there was not much change to the forward yield curve. So that is, there was almost no movements there. It was actually a little bit of an increase in the chance of maybe even another hike, not that it was very notable. So that's the kind of way that the Fed FOMC statement worked out. I wouldn't say there was too much to take in there. It's going to be very difficult now for the Fed to either hike or cut. So they're kind of like stuck in a land of theoretically holding firm. The unfortunate thing is we have no new dot plot. So when we get the new Fed dot plot, we'll update you first here on the channel to talk about that because really the bear case here for the next year is very much reliant on the Federal Reserve not cutting rates too much um, or something really breaking. And we'll talk about that later. So US bank failures over the last 23 years, the assets have already surpassed the global financial crisis, it looks like. However, of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of financial uh, companies going down. It's something that's worrying, though, even as a bear, you know, feeling that three to nine month kind of, you know, possible hard or, you know, not very good landing here in terms of a recession. I still think that the central bank showed their hand and they'll do whatever it takes. The key here, though, is what's going to happen with central bank monetary flow. We're going to have to be all over that and we've got a chart to update you on later on. What about the Barron's Big Money Bull, Bull Bear Survey? It's still very pessimistic. When we get reads like this, you'd think, wow, that probably means that the markets are going down. It means usually after the read, slightly worse than average returns over a few weeks. And the data set you can see here, it's not notably extremely bullish period. They got it very wrong, of course, coming out of 2020. Uh, they've been pessimistic a few times. Here's notably the last two years. One, they were correct. One, they were super wrong. So there's not a huge amount of read we can get from that. But what we can do is look at their positions. And I tell you what, major index combined hedge positions, geez, they're short. And they're very, very, very short overall from a hedged position standpoint. If we go to the put call ratio, though, you might think, well, that probably means that we're at a point where 
basically markets are very, very bullish. Well, yes, in some ways, but we're starting to see the put call ratio drop and it's kind of in between that 77 and 94%, which generally means there is a less annualized return. And if this keeps dropping, and we'll update you here on the Lobo put call ratios in the future, if that drops below the 77% read, that's when we start to really say, okay, well, the annualized returns become negative for the market in a market that is generally 68% positive just on the daily. So you can see that when you start to get these negative stats, that's when you need to be paying the most attention to the markets. What about corporate insiders? What are they doing? Well, generally speaking, they're still buying or they're still holding their stock. They were in a lockout though, so that's part of it. But uh, yeah, all corporate insiders have been holding on to their technology stocks. And you usually can take some solace in that if you're a long-term bull, as over a long period, they're usually correct. They often can be a bit more kangaroo-y though in the first couple of months after doing such a thing. So again, the data kind of points towards maybe a bit more positivity there, but I think it's really going to come down to central bank policies. And more importantly, this chart here. So I've updated it with an extra one just so you can see the difference here. The green line is effectively the US liquidity composed onto the chart and the purple line here is effectively the world liquidity. So that's all central banks around the world and I've kind of compiled my own list there. Now when you look at this on the surface you could say well what are we looking at? Well we're basically looking at the support for the market. If you think about this purple line in particular which is my favorite one realistically, it is a bit of a front loader. So if you're in a nice stuck zone and then you see this thing front load hard and then you get a breakout, more than likely it's a real breakout. And we've actually used this and it's part of the reason why I've been a bit negative on markets specifically around these zones uh, heavily over the last uh, couple of months. So obviously that February, mid-February point with the seasonality and the Q1 VIX spiking that usually occurs. Then, of course, we saw that huge injection. Well, otherwise, we would have gone down a lot more. So that was the central bank saying, no, we can't let it fail. And then we sit where we have been right now. If you look at it on the surface, you might say, oh, well, the markets have been really bullish this year, but it's really just 10 to 20 stocks. So obviously, tech's been bullish. Russell 2000 and 3000 are horrible. So it's a totally different story. It's the tale of almost three markets at this stage. So where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves with a close on the lows, which we'll talk about later. And of course, central bank policy slightly coming in with some support recently, though if that starts dropping off and we're still above it, it points towards the markets probably being a little overpriced at this stage to the current conditions that we're seeing. We mentioned in the previous video as well that post FOMC, the first one to two days are going to be important. The first initial reaction to the whole FOMC event was false. It moved up. Then, of course, it sold off. That's not unusual. It's very, very common. But now, will they unload their hedging? So basically, S&P 500 forward vol curves here. I've drawn it. This is pretty much what it looks like. The FOMC was the most hedged event coming into 2023, this particular one. And it depends on how this is going to unwind. Is it going to decay or are they going to effectively force buybacks in, creating a squeeze event? This is what we're going to have to see represented on the charts. But it's a very important thing that's going on right now in these markets. What about if you're an investor in the markets? We want to look at both sides here. Well, from an investor perspective, I think every investor out there wants the cheap price. Yeah, Or we want to get into a momentum style trade. Now, in this case, as an investor, is the market cheap? Well, I've got an update here as of the 30th of April, so during this earnings season, and you can see that the updated Ford PE is sitting about 18.2, and that is a lot, well, decently above the 25-year average. Now, this is where patience pays. We always say patience, react, don't predict. I really like Ford PE as one of the six major reasons that I like to get into markets as an investor, and we actually got opportunities, don't get me wrong. October, you know, I thought it was a pretty good opportunity in the 15s. However, you know, where we are right now, eh, it's not as good as it has been. You can see it's starting to actually pre-pandemic, it's getting into those points where you start to get a little bit scared. And I just want to reiterate that with this chart. It's looking at it. And unfortunately, if you look at it and then you think one week or two weeks away or even one month away, you'll often be blinded. This, this type of investing, it's especially buying the true dips it's very much a patience game. And that's something I just want to bring to this channel a little bit more to explain that process through. Let's move over to, is there a sell in May? 95 years of history suggests there is. Of course, 10 years history, 
basically sideways and 25 years is very similar. You, you tend not to actually see that much selling in May. It doesn't work like that though for the Australian viewers out there. Sell in May is a real thing in Australia and it's playing out at this stage. So that's because of usually a decline in metals pricing over that period, which we're seeing at this stage. So yeah, sell in May, that's the chart, that's the seasonality. We shared that over on our Twitter along with the Ford PE. So links in the description down below if you're interested to check those out. What about the NASDAQ and breadth? We said this in the last video, so I'm just going to skip over it. Obviously, the NASDAQ breadth is getting worse all the time. And we can see here the stats for the first couple of months when we get reads like this are less than positive. Um, but overall, you know, if you took a year, it's pretty damn good. So again, if you're if you're looking at these markets, we have to say, yeah, maybe the stats aren't great for now. And maybe the markets are overpriced. But what if they came down to Ford PE ratios that are a lot cheaper later on in the next three to six months? Well, could be a good opportunity. Let's have a look here at the commodities side. What's going on here? So commodity demand destruction is well in force. You would know that I'm quite quite negative on energy and metals, specifically copper. And I have been for a little while here on the channel, in fact, two months. And we're starting to see that really play out here. You can also see that when we get reads like this, theoretically, the next 12 months for everything to do with the commodity side is pretty negative. Now, this is good if you're an inflation watcher because, of course, it's basically showing you where the Fed is getting the job done and the market's front-loading that at this stage. Nine-month lows on agriculture, and you know that usually leads on to, of course, really bad returns. And you can see here, yeah, I mean, six months later, only 29% of the time is agriculture up after a read like this. So it's a pretty negative statistic indeed. Smart money versus dumb money, the chart is showing you that basically it's pretty much flatlining. Smart money and dumb money are where they were. Small increase in smart money, but very, very minimal. Fear and greed index is still neutral after the read of the FOMC, so nothing much there. But let's get into some rotation concepts. So at the moment, we're seeing a bit of earnings reports. AMD was pretty lackluster. Apple is the big one everyone's watching. A lot of people looking at this as whether it's a catalyst because it has consumer discretionary style properties with, of course, selling products. And it's expected to move between 4 and 5% in the earnings report. What about the last couple of days, though, of sector rotation? One of my favorite concepts here on the channel well, the first one is energy continued to be weak and regional banks got crushed and they got crushed more after hours. The banking sector is a sick, sick market at this stage in terms of stock. Actually, contrary to popular belief, quality bank bonds specifically secured against quality is actually pretty good. And you can see that with JP Morgan. And I've said that a few times here on the channel. What's been doing well? Well, gold had probably one of its better days. We saw a little bit of rotation into defensive sectors over the last 24 hours. But if we look at the last five days, it really puts in perspective how bad energy has gotten, how bad regional financial banks have been. And in general, it's just been a gold kind of balloon and panooza. And of course, when it broke out past that level yesterday, it was it was quite large in terms of the move from there. I was pretty neutral. It moved a day before the FOMC, showing that we'd broken a level. There's very little pullback and now it's going and trying to test those all-time highs. So we'll talk about that later on. So just before we jump into the charts and we take a look at all of the key levels we should be watching right now in the markets, I'd like to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Tiger Brokers. Now, Tiger Brokers have been offering a bunch of special offers, especially to our Australian viewers out there. And I've managed to recently secure some extra special offers if you fund your account with as little as one cent or with a total of $1,500 or more, you'll get extra Microsoft shares. And if you've been watching this channel for a while, you would know that Microsoft is my favorite stock. But what makes Tiger Brokers a little bit different from some of the other brokers out there has to be their constant participation in improving their platform. They've taken on some of the feedback that actually you, the community, has given me, and they've added that in. And one of my favorite things is always rotation. Now, recently, we've been talking about demand destruction in the markets, and specifically, that's showing up, obviously, in oil stocks. You might notice here, over the last five-day percentage change, oil has been the most hit sectors. And this is where you can see the tail of two markets, some defensives, technology stocks, and then, of course, regional banking. It's a totally different storyline coming through. One of my favorite things in the Tiger Brokers platform has to be this and obviously going through the different concepts and different strategies and understanding that there is rotation underneath the hood of the S&P 500. 
A lot of people believe that this year has been good, and it has thanks to top 10 stocks. However, if you look at under the hood, let's say the Russell 3000 or even US 2000, you will notice that there is a very different story being played out. That means there was opportunity for both bulls and bears. And of course, if you want to harness that opportunity and get access to some of the platform features such as this, along with the news into this earnings season, then you can do so with the links in the description down below. All right, let's get into the charts and we'll start off here with the RSP, which is the equal weighted S&P 500. So what's it telling us? Well, it's saying that things are kind of turning and that the trend is about to change to the downside. So it's it's pretty much a pivotal point here for the S&P 500 and how is it going to trade over this next 24 hours? You can see here though, the equal weight, which is where we take out that kind of force of the top 10 technology stocks is not anywhere near as healthy as the rest of the market. Let's have a look at consumer discretionary versus staples. Again, the American consumer is coming under pressure. That's what this chart's showing us, basically one third of the US economy. It's not a great sign when you're looking for recoveries in markets, true recoveries. If you get true recoveries, usually this sector, this particular style of combo is doing a lot better. And you can go back through history and you'll see what I mean when you're coming out of bad times. What about the forward yields? Here we have the September 2023 expectation of what the market believes the Fed will do. Very little change here over the FOMC. So it's they're still predicting rate cuts. And this is where the market is going to fight with the Fed. If the dot plot that they put out last time is to believe, believed, they will pause and hold. And I still think that is actually the right thing to do. But the Federal Reserve, you can't always trust them. <laughs> the bear case certainly is that they will hold. If not, inflation will stay basically pretty consistent or sticky and that they won't be able to cut, cut it like the market wants. Now, the market is saying that by December of uh, this year, we're basically going to be multiple cuts in all the way down to 4.33. So that's the market's opinion. Of course, it is not uh, the Federal Reserve's opinion of what they're claiming right now. But if this does occur, well, it's part of the reason why we're getting that support of the big tech companies versus everything else. Copper was unable to break through our lows. So we still don't see copper going through the bottom. Maybe that will be non-farm payrolls that gets us through. We do need to see copper weaken though further if we are to believe that these markets are not due for potential squeezes or rallies. I want copper underneath 3.7 for that to occur. And I've been negative on copper, of course, since January. So this is definitely a big component. And you can see here, is this a double bottom? Well, we don't know yet, but it's coming off this base. So we're looking for that weekly close. We've still got a lot of news to play out throughout this week. And you can see how big a weekly close would be, a new low close. That's significant. Let's go over to high yield bonds. Now, high yield bonds didn't fare too well in line with the market going down. If high yield bonds make a new low, potentially under something like 7431, specifically, remember if high yields go down and stock markets go up, I trust the bonds every time on that one. And we just haven't really seen that synergy play out just yet. But high yields are not as high as they were during the February high. So it's kind of saying like this rally at the moment is maybe fake uh, in, in some aspects in terms of the overall resilience of the economy post this whole Silicon Valley bank and everything else that's gone on. What about treasuries? They're holding okay, no movement because yields didn't move enough. So they're just kind of hovering in a zone here, not doing much. The dollar was the one that got beaten though. And it looks like it's wanting to get a new low in it. Basically, people like Druckenmiller, who is a beast, he really hates the dollar right now. He's a big bear on it. I mean, a big bear. I watched an interview with him recently. It's like the only thing he has conviction in and possibly gold towards a longer term high, which I agree with as well. So you can see here the dollar is, is falling. No new low on the daily close. But if that does happen, you'd have to think that the market is going to move back down below parity. And my next levels, if the dollar does fail, would be in the 99.98. I've found dollar very tough throughout this zone. And the main reason is because we knew it was in either an accumulation or a distribution. Based on this and where we are right now, you're starting to think, okay, well, rallies should be met by sell demand and dollar will continue to weaken. But, you know, stick to it. I don't think there's a super amount that you can do on that chart that's like super great until we get those breakouts. What about gold? Well, gold had a huge rally. I mean, it really did rally hard and um, it's just filled the gap 
So you can see here, it gapped up massive, filled it back down. And this was the level that made you go bullish in terms of catalyst. It didn't even come down much though. It basically just did a huge movement and it was very, very quick. If we take the trend line here and we move that one out, this should have been probably around the move that we expect. The weekly close will be the big one on here. Non-farms is still coming. Gold has traditionally had a really tough time up here. And some of the stats we shared recently as well, don't bold, don't really go that well with gold. So is this like a false break and everyone getting a little bit too hyped about it? Uh, possibly. I mean, the trend was certainly up. It's gone past that first take, which I would have had somewhere around 2043. It didn't pull back enough for me. So we'll update this chart, I believe, more over the next 48 hours. And then post non-farms, I really want to start getting uh, more on top of the gold situation. Natural gas has been requested to come back. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Well, we filled the gap, which we thought would happen. To go bullish back on natural gas, I want it above that high here, which is going to be 230. Do I like natural gas? Uh, the futures contract is the widow maker, yes. Yeah? So the futures contracts that you're trading are very expensive on the roll. So you just got to be careful with this one. I'm sure some people have been hurt by it. If you have or you understand the roll contracts and how expensive they can be, put it in the comments, help out your fellow traders and investors. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like it above there to really solidify this being a, a uh, more of a fake out before it, it, it moves to the upside. US oil took a new low, so very negative, came into the demand box and just found super acceleration. I don't really want to short oil here, nor do I want to long it yet. But if you were on the long side of oil, you're probably looking for something like a 61.8 fib pullback here of this particular oil run. That was a fairly large buy-up, which shows you that it was oversold. I mean, it's been getting destroyed in recent days, which is great if you've uh, been following our energy discussion. But yeah, I, I could see it doing this for a little bit, finding some reprieve. Oil has not quite hit the super lows, which is around these 61s and this these 58s. And I suspect at some point we'll get into here, if not even lower if demand destruction's there. But you can just see so many people would have put in shorts right there. It's a terrible place to short and stop losses would have been absolutely hammered. So I can see why it's squeezed back up and it might be some reprieve here for oil after some heavy selling the last couple of sessions. What about Tesla? Still a bad chart. Doesn't look good and it still hasn't got above our white line. We've been sitting here saying it doesn't look good for days. For Tesla sellers, what are you looking for? Probably underneath these little two wicks. So you can see here around this 158.80, we're looking for it to get underneath that and then, of course, float through to fill the gap that we've spoken about now for what seems like an eon, but I guess it's only a month or a bit. So, yeah, this is a level that I wanted to see happen. At this stage with these wicks, it does look like that. If you're a squeeze bull buyer... You're looking for Tesla out of the gates really strong, hopefully gapping past these two wicks, so opening above. And if that did occur, you'd be looking for the 180. So there's actually two decent uh, potentials here on the charts themselves. NVIDIA, the watch reaction level has so far been bearish. We don't know still if this is a Wyckoff UTAD. So basically a distribution, false break, pull down, and uh, keeps moving lower. If the market is going to go bearish here, though, NVIDIA will do something like this. And when that occurs, well, you'll know what it is. It's it's pretty much an unwind of what's been an epic run. And at this stage, the weekly looks pretty bad, but we don't have necessarily the catalyst other than day traders going at this level. And I wouldn't have blamed you at all. I bought it up before and I said, it's a pretty damn good level. <laughs> it was the first time I was like, yeah, that's that's a pretty damn good level. Let's move over to Apple. Very tough, very tough to pick one. I'm looking for after the earnings report. If we spike into here, I think bears will sit here. So I think bears sit somewhere around those 175s. And you can see it's an expected weekly options high. It's also previous highs. So if we get that initial spike on Apple, that could be a catalyst towards the bear side. For buyers, though, I don't really like most of the prices here. So, yeah, I mean, have we got a rejection or anything? No. I mean, the trend is still up. It's still intact. Very small time frames like the two-hour are showing a double top close low. I wouldn't trust it enough, unfortunately, into an earnings result because it just isn't going to hold if the earnings are good. Uh, but, yeah, that's a little double top. Some people will bring that up. It's just not a strong enough pattern considering it's in the middle of 
not really the key key zone for how we're looking at Apple at this stage. Let's move over to energy. You can see here the sector really getting just a massive shellacking. I'm very negative on this sector and I guess the stats also point towards that. If you look at Zom, Exxon was one of the better kind of trades there and that's continued on. I still think there's more in these to go down. However, you know, it's it's already flogged a lot. So it's more, will there be some kind of reprieve before the dumping? There's other stocks that have done similar things like this, like Rio here in Australia. And you can see it's had a little bit of an upside today, but overall it's been a lot of selling, a lot of hard selling on metals and oil because of the demand destruction. If we take a look at seasonality here for oil, you'll notice that it does tend to have kind of like this weakness in May. There's sometimes a really strong push into June, which is there, and then it's just horrible. So this is the time that I usually do not like oil stocks very much. This is the bad period of the year. There's sometimes a bit of a run, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention because, of course, it's always good to see where we are in comparison to what has generally happened. If you actually look at the charts, you'll notice they've followed very similar to this pattern this year, and specifically, that's the oil and ZOM. Let's move over to regional sector banks. Horrible, horrible, terrible. Don't want to look at it. <laughs> it's really bad. You do not want to try to buy the dip on these type of regional banks. You have to see structure. To stop a 20% plus decline generally takes time and it generally takes a nice accumulation structure. Just trying to buy dips here, this is not where you usually do it. I just think it's it looks bad on the charts. It's coming down to big levels. No doubt it's getting through every FIB extension you've seen and you're coming into where you expect the markets to maybe find some buyers, maybe 35 but I just don't like it. So the regional banks are a dangerous, scary place to be, although it probably is going to become oversold soon. So there are certain strategies that can go with that, but you need to know what you're doing. Let's move over here to the DAX. So the DAX has rallied. It failed to go through a new low. This, of course, could be a false break. We don't know yet. That's a pretty bad looking candle. We are rallying here in the after hours after everything turned really bad. So, of course, it looks like the markets are going up and maybe they are, but this is all critical across the board. The only market it's not really critical on is probably something like the Australian market because it's going to rely more on oil price and more on metals. So, yeah, the Australian market, quite a lot weaker in comparison. You can see here for the Australian viewers, we've been talking about weakness. I think there's a potential that around 7,100 may be slightly bought up, but I'm still very negative on this particular market moving forward and we'll keep watching it. Let's look at IWM, bad close, came back, filled the gap that was here, looked like it was rallying in the morning, first moves the false move, and then bang, smashed, smashed it straight back down. Russell 2000 futures, you can see how they look. Still no significant bearish close below these lows. So just this zone is, is ridiculously strong. But I'll tell you this, when you look at charts like that and you look at these huge rejection wicks, imagine if the squeeze came through and it went above here. If that happened, ooh, ooh, all of a sudden, if we went boom, 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 got a new high above like that 18, 17, 80, 90 level, I think you'd be hard pressed to be bearish there. That would be a very bullish signal because it's basically saying, yeah, we tricked you completely. And they're the kind of zones where if you have superior patience, you can react to them. We'll be watching that scenario. It looks pretty bad on paper though at the moment. Weekly close as well, still not underneath these last levels. So we'll be watching. And of course, the Russell 2000 is, is one of those markets we're looking at pretty clearly. Let's move over to the NASDAQ. We understand here on the queues, we got that initial movement into the watch reaction zone area that we've had on the charts and then bang, smashed down. It was much stronger than the S&P in general. So we'll look at that in a second, but it did end up closing to a new low, kind of showing that maybe it's got a little bit more in it uh, and rallies could be met by sell demand. We'll go over here to the US 100, similar thing comes up, fakes out, false move first, and then all of a sudden straight back down. Very classic, you know, Jerome Powell, speechy, FOMC kind of event, do 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 do, do bang. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's just the way that these kind of th events do work out. We'll see here with the SPY, ended up closing underneath, underneath its 20 moving average. So that's, that's notable for sure. And if you're looking at this, you could say, oh, that looks like distribution, false break up here on the top side, 
resistance, supply, whatever you want to call it, but you really need to get underneath the previous lows. So let's have a look at the SPX here. So the S&P 4090, it's a good zone, but it's not enough. If we go to the futures market here, you'll understand what I mean. Look at where this futures market has gone after hours. It's tapped into that 4068 and instantly found the buyers. So this is the, the fight zone of the markets at this stage. We're looking for daily closes underneath this 4068 to really solidify that this market wants to tip over and it's looking towards that bear side. We can see that squeeze indicators are starting to show that the pain trade is to the downside. And I wanted to bring that up because it's been a relatively good switch to see continuation for a little while and um, usually breakouts, but we just started reading it. And I've, I've had, you know, here are the reads recently. And the, the read is now towards the negative, but if the, the unwind's going to happen, this is the zone where the buyers commit, somewhere around this 40-60, as we mentioned in the previous video. If we go back to the one hour, it pretty much did exactly what we thought, which would be a rally, a movement up, came back to a 61.8. I liked it to about 40.70. I thought it might actually get 40 4160, 47, uh, 4170, somewhere in there would have been better. This was still very much in line with uh, what usually does occur though. First move being the false move. This now is, is tough. If you want to know where the squeezes are going to occur, I think if the market is able to regain above this high, which is the price of 4150, at that point, you kind of got to believe that the, that unwind of all those hedges is happening and we're going to move higher. So I kind of feel like this is a very big catalyst event for the markets. We get above there, pullbacks are met by buy demand, and then all of a sudden we're moving, you know, possibly through 42.20 and all the way up to the 4300s. Where we are right now is still very negative. So if markets do regain, go back into here, we know it's a heavily traded zone. So we know around that 41.20 is where bears may sit over the next 24 hours. So rallies, that's where the bears may sit. Bulls manage to regain up here. There's at least a statistical chance that that markets do this type of thing. And that's what a trader is doing. You're basically looking for the catalyst events that you believe are going to come through and where they're at. Daily closes underneath 4050, I think as well, will be significant. Take that low out, close underneath. That should solidify the bears are back in control. We can finally move to fill all these stupid gaps that we've got uh, opened up because we do have a lot of gaps. We've still got one, two, and three that haven't been filled in the real market action. What about the options? Well, still a lot of puts. Max Payne sits at 410, not that it really matters. And we've got calls and puts sitting on both sides, 405 on the put wall. Call wall's about four, uh, 415, and current price is about 407 to 8 at this stage. So as you know, we're just sitting in the middle. Is technically where Wall Street wants it. Bitcoin was an excellent trade. If you took this one long, well done to you. Uh, it's literally in line with what exactly we're talking about, though I have highlighted out a short bear area, which I think is pretty interesting. So this is a previous kind of lots and lots of levels. The most traded zone actually is here. So it's a very heavily traded level right there. But I do think that there's a potential chance that maybe we get like this, movement down and that that Bitcoin kind of struggles in this zone. For bears, they want to see this market effectively stop somewhere in here. If you get a new high and a closure above that high, probably moving quite a lot more up for Bitcoin. But this is a beautiful little rally and actually an excellent little take profit that's, that's probably more in this red zone. But here's, I can see you scaling back a little bit. Nice. Not too bad. Bitcoin's been better actually than some of the other charts and yeah, as of the last 24 hours, that was probably one of the better ones. Let's move over to the news for the week ahead. Of course, Friday, we have here non-farm payroll change, 8.30 a.m. I know that's back in Friday, April. <laughs> we'll just quickly scroll forward here, but it's actually the same thing. So there we go. Non-farm employment change. There it is. Friday, 8.30 New York time. And if you're interested as well, remember to come and follow us over on our other social media platforms. You can do so. And it's easy as clicking the button, get three free trading cheat sheets as well if you post that one in. And do remember as well, the special offers down in the description below for Tiger Brokers. There's plenty of them there. And for Australians, for a limited time, remember if you fund with as little as 1500 Australian dollars within the first seven days, you'll get an additional 30 on top of 25 on top of the other bonuses. It's not too bad, is it? 
All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to subscribe, smash that like button. See you in the next one. Bye for now.